Uh, so I'm going to get started by introducing our speaker. So my name is Joe DeVito. I work as a research coordinator in the Center for M Health and Social Media at UConn. And today we are very excited to welcome Dr. Gina Merchant um, to share her, you know, expertise and her experiences um, working in industry. And so Dr. Merchant is a behavioral scientist specializing in digital health product development, research and strategy, and currently works as a consultant to the health tech industry. So she has experience in startup environments and market leading medical device companies, and she is adept to bringing the scientific method to the business arena. Dr. Merchant specializes in cardiometabolic health, and she's an expert on deriving actionable insights from real world data across behavioral domains, including physical activity, sleep, and therapy adherence. She does have extensive experience applying cutting edge methods to design for multiple behavior change and to define effective user engagement while working in close collaboration with data science and engineering. So Dr. Merchant is an advocate for increasing the presence, participation, and equitable representation of women and Black, Indigenous, and people of color in STEM and industry-facing roles. She's dedicated to mentorship and in particular supporting scholars who are considering the transition from an academic career path to an industry career path. She has authored more than 20 peer reviewed publications and works at the intersection of public health, psychology and technology. Dr. Merchant holds a PhD in public health from UC San Diego and San Diego State. She has an MA in experimental psychology from Cal State San Marcos and a BA in psychology from UC San Diego. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Marchin. We're quite eager to hear what she has to say today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joe, and welcome, everybody. Um, I'm on the West Coast, so it's 8 a.m. my time. Um, and wherever you are joining me from, I hope the day is treating you well. So, um, first, I just got off the streamer. Um, obviously, this is from my personal experience um, and perspective, so it may not generalize to everyone's experience, um, but I have really tried to distill common challenges and experiences that I think cut across all the various places that you might find yourself working in health tech. Uh, secondly, I make no assumptions about what you know or you don't. So some of the things I say, you may be thinking, oh gosh, I of course know this, or I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and both of those things are totally fine. Um, I do want to spend a fair amount of time in our Q&A period, because I think that that's where we're really going to generate some rich conversation, um, either reflecting on the things that I have discussed or things that you really wanted to know that you didn't hear me talk about. The third uh, point I'd like to make is that I do not think that scientists or medically trained doctors have all the answers. So while I am extremely critical, um, and I do think appropriately so, it is not because I'm coming from a position that we can solve everything. Having said that, I do think that the massive shortage of academically trained research scientists, public health professionals, behavioral scientists, health psychologists, statisticians in particular, which is actually not something that I go into detail in today, but we can talk about, um, is highly problematic and is really holding the industry back. <clears throat> so today's talking points, um, I tried to keep it uh, succinct so that we could uh, cover a lot of ground, um, but still go in depth in some of the common challenges and the things that I think you should come away knowing after this talk is over. So the first is I want to explain what I mean by health tech is tech. The second is um, briefly going over my background and the transition that I experienced. Uh, the third is five common challenges, and there'll be some stories that I tell to kind of bolster or explain the experience behind these challenges. And then the top three things that I think you should know. The number one question that I think you should ask yourself. And then, as I said, doing a really uh, not lengthy, but like um, in depth Q&A so that we can get uh, some dynamic exchanges around this topic. So health tech is tech. Um, I actually used to have a very heated, um, lively exchange with one of my colleagues. When I first left uh, academic environment, I joined a UX team at ResMed, so very large, well, by my estimation, it's both very large. Um, it's only, only 6,000 people globally, and that includes a very large sales force, um, but it is a global uh, market-leading organization, and I was embedded on the UX team in product development. 
And the lead mobile UX designer, <clears throat> my friend Maria, would always say, I, I would get so frustrated and I would say like, you know, why is health tech so weird? Like, why are these processes in place? So why is there a complete lack of processes? And she would shake her head and look at me very seriously and say, Gina, because health tech is tech. And I would argue with her because I would say, no, 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 it's medicine, it's science, it's different. So that was uh, coming up on four years ago. Um, and I can stand here before you today and say that I was wrong. And what I mean by that is the industry itself is born out of Silicon Valley. Um, it has a lot of the same interests that technology does and the beliefs and cultures and core value systems. Um, and three of those are really looking at disruption. So the first, the healthcare system is antiquated, that's the core belief, and therefore it's right for disruption. And so the focus is more on changing things and this perception that everything is broken, as opposed to thinking about what can you borrow from the healthcare system that's positive and adapt it for the 21st century. The second is that data equals money. So we obviously know this with social media, this is accelerating um, at an astronomical rate. Uh, and <clears throat> what that manifests is, is a lot of people are going to be put in positions, um, such as positions that I was put in, where it's a kitchen sink approach, right? We really want to collect as much data from the end user as possible because at some point along the journey in our product development or people we're going to partner with or vendors or customers, you know, our ability to amass large quantities of data is going to make us a more valuable company. And obviously, from a healthcare standpoint, that can be incredibly uh, damaging from a privacy and security standpoint. Um, we want to make sure that if it's a person's healthcare data, in particular socio-demographics, what have you, that we treat those data with a lot of respect. The third is that tech, in and of itself, um, a core implicit assumption is that technology is going to make things faster, cheaper, and more accessible. Now, we all know that technology is enabling us to have the conversation we're having today, and that without technology, we wouldn't have a lot of the predictive algorithms for early detection of things. Um, we wouldn't have some of the, you know, really complicated uh, robotics, um, you know, interesting and, and you know, very innovative um, abilities to do, you know, microscopic surgeries, what have you. Like, it runs across the gamut. There's lots of ways that we can look at technology and say that it's, it's really transformed our ability to deliver um, healthcare. However, especially in the digital health world, it is often used when it doesn't need to be. So I'll give you a very clear example. Uh, text messaging is a highly underutilized, very unsexy, you know, old school way to reach people where they are as they go about their daily lives. And I can't tell you the number of times that I've been in the room where a CTO who's got a background in maybe bachelor's in computer science, maybe a master's, um, and then, you know, an MBA, and been working for 20 years or so, you know, achieved really high ranks, and their goal is AI first. Now I don't even know what that really means, other than to say they need artificial intelligence, and they want to lead with it. So they want to take that solution out of the box, and they say, I want to position this at the forefront of my product solution. And the reason that's problematic is because it's like trying to, you know, bake a simple uh, chocolate cake with like a $5,000 truffle oil when, you know, a simple butter will do. Um, the last point I'd like to make on this is that culture, um, you know, the companies are built on cultures that are really, unfortunately, disproportionately young white males. And so what that translates into is a way of thinking and a way of doing things that is often less inclusive than it needs to be, especially when we're considering healthcare disparities, we're considering the incidence, morbidity, and mortality of chronic disease. Um, I'd like to point out M Disrupt, which is a company that was started by Rudy Gadelab, um and Jill Hagenford. Jill was the former chief medical officer of 23andMe, and she's a pathologist, medically trained doctor. Rudy is a commercialization expert, and they looked at this problem and they said, look, We've been working, um, you know, as executives in Silicon Valley and biotech for decades, and we think that these startups need more regulation. So instead of focusing on going fast and breaking things, we want to bring to the conversation, first, do no harm to the Hippocratic Oath, um, and we want to help bring products to market that are safer, more evidence-based, 
And so that consulting agency, if you're interested, is hiring experts um, across epidemiology, statistics, public health, behavioral science, and they're a network of folks. And when they get contracted as a consulting agency to work with someone who's trying to bring a product to market, they tap into that expert network um, and then help improve um, the efficacy of that product. So I mentioned uh, diversity is a problem. This has been written about extensively. And I think that, um, you know, there's plenty of articles that you can read with a quick Google search. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to say is it is improving. Um, there are specific venture capital. So those are the folks that are investing um, and trying to make money off of health tech startup investments that are now specifically dedicated to underestimated or underrepresented founders. So Backstage Capital founded by Arlen Hamilton, who is a black gay woman um, and is a very vocal advocate of increasing the representation of diverse founders, not just in health tech or tech, but just in startups um, writ large, is an incredible voice in this space and I highly recommend you follow her. There's also the Female Founders Fund and um, I'll just highlight here one of the the sobering statistics. So less than 10% of all VC deals go to women, people of color, and LGBTQ founders. And part of the problem is that on the side of the folks that are making the investment decisions, uh, women only account for 12.2% of the digital health VC partners. Um, and as I was finalizing the slides for today, just yesterday, Rock Health produced their first annual diversity and digital health annual report led by these three authors that you see here. I highly recommend you go check this out. They did great survey methodology. They intersected race, gender, geography, um, socioeconomic status, uh, founder type, and all of these other data. And they really presented a, a stark um, but important picture for people to really look at and, and start to make better decisions around investment in digital health. So Arlen Hamilton's picture you can see here on the far left, that's her Twitter hand, handle, Arlen was here. Del Johnson and is another excellent voice in this space. He unapologetically calls out on Twitter all sorts of old school VC, uh, mostly guys. Um, I also really admire, admire Haley Teko. She was the founder of Rock Health, which um, I mentioned on the previous slide. So that was the first digital health only uh, VC firm. And now they produce things like that annual report and are really active in the space trying to increase diversity. Haley has gone on to found another company called Natalis, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, but that focuses on looking at uh, kind of the femtech uh, product space. So, so helping women conceive. Um, and really speaking truth about what it is like to go through infertility issues of using her own voice in that experience. Um, and it's a really awesome company. So I wanted to briefly touch on um, the difference between health tech and med tech, because you might hear those used interchangeably. And I'll be totally honest, um, <laughs> if you, you know, put my, my hand to the fire and ask me without notes to how I would differentiate the two, I might say it differently than other people. I think that it's one of those things that is a little bit of a buzzword and we're not exactly sure how to define it. So don't, you know, take away from this that the way that I've defined it is perfect. Um, and this is obviously in part because digital therapeutics in particular is still the wild west and as a space that's starting to be regulated more. Um, so the Digital Therapeutics Alliance is a great resource if you're interested in learning more about how these terms are defined and, and where things are sliced up in, in, in terms of the regulatory spectrum. Um, and that usually starts at the wellness side and then obviously all the, all the way up into um, a medical device um, that has to have full FDA clearance. So generally speaking, I consider health tech to be more of the wellness and prevention space. It does extend into software as a digital therapeutic. It is usually software first. It may or may not include an ancillary hardware medical device including things like telemedicine, genomics, diagnostics, remote monitoring, um, and healthcare security companies. And so I just gave a few examples below. Color genomics, similar to 23andMe, you send in your swab, they give you back uh, your sequencing. 
Electro Labs is um, another female-led company, Andy Corvos, who used to work at the FDA. If you're interested in really showing up and bringing expertise to um, cataloging things like apps, uh, wearable devices, and decentralized clinical trials, I highly recommend you look at Electro Labs. Uh, um, Medible is another example, also happens to be a female founder, uh, Michelle Longmire. You might have heard of One Medical. And then MedTech. MedTech is traditionally treating existing medical conditions, and that will usually involve medical devices or hardware. This is a really interesting area because a lot of these companies are quite large. They could include pharma companies like Lilly that I have here. So ResMed, as I mentioned, is the company that I started out in when I left an academic environment. And ResMed is an interesting case because they really represent what a lot of these companies are trying to do, which is to say, look, we earned our place in the market by developing, in this case, a flow generator and a mask, which is the therapeutic combination that's required to treat sleep apnea and sleep disorder breathing. But that's not enough, right? These people outside of the clinical doctor's office setting are going to need remote support. So then they start to build patient-facing apps. Then they start to build healthcare provider facing interfaces that are supposed to like integrate with the EHR and help people better manage their patient population. Well, when they start to branch out and do those things, they're trying to take their giant Titanic and steer it into software as a service. And they don't necessarily have the infrastructure expertise to do that, but they realize that they have to to stay competitive and relevant in their space. So I really want to draw the distinction, like if you're going to consider going to more of the the health tech, that's usually like startups and more uh, like newer companies that aren't as well established, not always the case, but generally speaking. And then med tech might be your larger, more established medical device companies. All right, so now we'll get into the meat of the talk. So my background um, and the transition that I experienced. I'm not going to go through my entire time in academia. I do find it useful to show a visual representation. Um, I spent a very long time, so 16 years. Um, oh, I would be remiss without mentioning that I did play soccer at the University of Connecticut uh, from 2002, the 2002 season to 2003 before transferring uh, back to California to finish out my, my bachelor's degree, so go Huskies. But as I mentioned, it was a long time, so 16 years. Um, and the reason I think that's important to highlight is that a lot of my personality and the approach to problem solving and the way that I had developed internal process, processes to understand the world around me and really work within teams um, was born out of this long you know, experience um, in academic environments. And despite it being a long time, I did or I do feel like I had a lot of diverse experience. I started in junior college. I then, uh, like I said, went to the University of Connecticut. I played collegiate soccer, transferred back to California. I, I played another sport, track and field. Um, I studied abroad. I, I did all of these things. Um, I spent some time out. I worked at the YMCA, coached soccer. So, I, and, and then I did do a postdoc, which I'll talk about in a minute. So I felt like across all of those things, that I had, you know, not just like, oh gosh, one institution for 10 years or what have you. But despite that, it was shell shocking. Um, it, it was just very jarring to use words that I've heard others describe this as to make that transition. And, and that's not to uh, paint it as good or bad. It's just that despite feeling like I had met and engaged with a lot of different teams and a lot of different people across a lot of different contexts, um, in particular, for example, when I was at UC San Diego doing my PhD, I was part of an interdisciplinary team in mobile health, and we worked with a lot of engineers, we worked with a lot of user-centered design folks, computer scientists. Um, I did health disparities work with folks um, in South San Diego, and yet it's just a whole different world when you get out of an academic environment. Um, I know folks are probably wondering if they need to do a postdoc. And the short answer, which we can get into more in the Q&A, is no. Um, and in fact, I think if you are really convinced that you know that you want to get into industry, that sooner is probably better. 
Having said that, um, I'll be a good academic and contradict myself and, and give a both answer. So I think that the skills that I in particular acquired during my postdoc experience have served me incredibly well. Um, and that is in part because I did um, biomedical informatics and so I was working with quote unquote big data, whatever that means, um, and working on machine learning algorithms, um, you know, deep neural networks. I wasn't writing the code for that, but I was working with people who were. And so having had that experience, I feel like I can really speak intelligently when people try to raise certain opinions or issues um, around data science um, in an industry environment. So at the end of 2020, I will be closing out my third year in industry. Um, I started at Resident, I was there for two years. I did a little bit of consulting with them disrupt as I was trying to figure out what my next move was. And then I actually was part of a group of uh, scientists who tried to start a startup that did not start up, and part of that was because we were all scientists. Um, and then when that didn't work, I made the transition um, into OneDrop, and I was there for just six months. So culturally, it was not a good fit, um, and it was a short, fast, and furious kind of relationship, and I'm glad to be out the other side, but I'm also glad to have had the experience. So now I do uh, full-time consulting on behalf of myself, um, not incorporated, but the name of my uh, company, so to speak, is SoHalt. I also just recently, as of a couple weeks ago, took a part-time contract position doing clinical strategy with Headspace. So the transition, um, if I had to describe them in adjectives, I would say the positive is that it was liberating, challenging, promising, and validating. The negatives, I would say, is confusing, disappointing, bureaucratic, and lonely. So I'll go through a couple examples. Um, so the liberating, I'll be really honest, I think financially, um, you know, that was a big motivator for me to get out of uh, postdoc income trajectory and, you know, uh, new professor pay. It's not that it's bad money, it's just that I was in a position where I wanted to feel like I could bring in more um, to my family. And the grant cycle, the kind of pressure to publish, it just wasn't jiving with what I wanted. So it was very liberating for me to leave that environment. I really welcomed the challenge. I had heard a lot that there was an appetite for people like us in industry, and so that was a really welcome challenge for me. And then promising, once I got in to my first job, it was immediately clear that there was a lot of opportunity there. And, and so that made me feel like there was a lot of promise and potential. And then validating, I would say, um, I actually didn't receive a lot of internal support. Um, I won't say that my advisors or mentors or people I worked with were, you know, trying to squash my dreams, but it just felt like, Gina, are you sure that this is really what you want to do? Because once you leave, like, you can't come back, which I don't think is true. But once I did leave, um, again, the reception from the folks that I was working with, like, oh, we're so glad you're here, this is awesome, really felt validating for me. So for the negative, so confusing. Um, you'll see the buzzword um, images that I have here. We've got jargon in academia, but oh boy, are there buzzwords in industry. And a lot of times people would say that they wanted things and what they said they wanted wasn't actually what they wanted. And so what I mean by that, um, people would say, we're gonna do a research study and when they say a research study, they don't mean what you or I might think they mean. Um, so I'll just give a quick, uh, an example actually of a personalization. So when we talk about personalization, we know the level of rigor that we can now do personalization based on you know, ecological momentary assessment, which is reaching people as they go about their day as opposed to you know, a one-off cross-sectional survey. And so I was in a position working within the marketing team where we would take in these requirements from people in marketing saying, we need to collect these data because then we can sell more to this uh, segment, uh, customer segment. But we also want to personalize. We want the user experience to feel really, you know, individualized and tailored. And so I take that on as to say, okay, great. Like, here are the questions that we need to ask. Here's the cadence with which we need to ask them. Here's we, how we can do progressive profiling during the onboarding session. And I bring that to the table and 
in so many words, it's like I kind of get lost out of the room. Um, and it's because, well, that's just too much dev time. Like we can't afford to do that. And so you're going to run into experiences where someone is saying that they want something from you. And because you speak such different languages, it's very confusing because what you interpret, what they think that they want is not what they actually need, or it's what they want their marketing claim to be, but it's not what they actually want to kind of put the muscle behind to produce in the product development cycle. Disappointing. Um, I don't mean to be depressing about this, but there's just no other way to say it than to say it plainly. Um, a lot of what I did for my first two years was very simple and basic. And I felt that that was really disappointing because I thought that all of the things that I had been told was that going out into industry, you're going to make a bigger impact more quickly. And you're going to get to really do like implementation science and translate what's happening in an academic environment directly into a product or a service that's going to impact the lives of people who need it. And the reality is there just isn't the infrastructure support to execute on a lot of that science. So um, I'll give an example of a machine learning algorithm. So there had been internal development of something that was going to predict who was going to, um, a, a customer segment that was going to need to be reached early because they were at risk of not adhering to their therapy. And so this got developed before I came in. And I got brought into the team to try to kind of shore things up so that it could be deployed in a pilot. So I was in charge of developing the pilot, working with some of the health coaches, um, some of the folks in the business side to decide what market to deploy this in. But obviously I started to ask more targeted questions about the algorithm itself. Well, come to find out the data set that it was trained on and the work that had been done to cross validate and the way that the company had gone after you know, 90% accuracy and how they were understanding sensitivity and specificity was just really not good enough. And that if we were going to deploy it at scale, it would be problematic. Now, I'm not an epidemiologist. So here I am going back to my epi book and like really, you know, digging deep into the literature to make sure that I'm explaining these things correctly. Um, and I can speak more to that as a specific example, but I think, you know, that's a problem that you're going to run into is that you're just in an environment where people don't know what they think they know. And so you can feel this gets to the lonely aspect. You're all alone as the token behavioral scientist or whatever you call yourself, health psychologist, and there's not other people to lean on. Um, and so the, you end up descoping or kind of deprioritizing your goals because you realize you really need to start at a basic level. I think that the bureaucratic kind of speaks for itself. Um, but what I do want to highlight is that there are really well entrenched power structures um, that I didn't appreciate coming out of an academic environment in terms of, you know, depending on the organization, associate level, junior level, manager, director, senior director. And the way that people respect those boundaries is different, I think, from what I experienced in academia. So in academia, um, obviously, there's a lot of issues where, you know, there's really senior people that think they know everything, what have you, every place has problems like that. But generally, if you came to a scientific conference and you had really awesome results, the results would speak for themselves and people wouldn't judge you for your age or gender, the color of your skin. And I have definitely had my fair share of experiences where because I'm a court academic or I'm too junior or I'm too new to industry or whatever it is that I am not listened to no matter how striking the evidence that I'm presenting is. Okay, the five common challenges. The first one, um, I would say I hope I'm not offending anyone by having X marks through the book Hooked and BJ Fogg's model, but I also would ask yourself if you are offended um, to go back and really interrogate the evidence to back up those two people's um, kind of methods and, and, and the things that they're selling to the public. And, and the reason I have those on this slide is because it's astonishing how much people will equate behavioral science and the science of behavior chain with BJ Fogg. And then near aisle is a 
uh, journalist. Um, I think he might have an MBA, but he's not trained as a scientist in any way, shape, or form. And so at a high level, it's that people don't understand what you do. Um, there's no real precedent. I was an N of one at ResMed. Um, by the time I left, they had hired one other behavioral scientist, and she was in Ireland. So we corresponded briefly. But you will might find yourself in situations where people just want to send reminders because they think the problem is forgetting, and so they want to nudge people. They will talk a lot about behavioral economics and that financial incentives are really going to solve therapy adherence. Now, interestingly, with that example, I clued into that pretty quickly um, when I was at ResMed because therapy adherence is a big issue with sleep apnea. And I just so happened to read an article in the New York Times about a company who was doing loss aversion and financial incentive interventions with their adherence, and they were a great partner to work with. And so I was able to set up um, the first behavioral science experiment at ResMed using a behavioral economics approach. I had never done that before in academia. I had to kind of hold my nose at the beginning of it because I felt like I wasn't being true to, you know, behavior change techniques all of these other things that we know we can kind of stack on top of each other and build together to deliver an efficacious intervention. But the reality is I had to deliver something that was going to be attractive to the powers that be within the company. I had to also make it scientifically based so that it would work. Um, and I had to kind of let go of a lot of my academic ego to meet people where they were and, and try to really make inroads um, and, and Establish behavioral science as a core competency at the company. You will hear the word motivation all the time, and people do not mean self determination theory, um, but you can share the value of self determination theory. Um, I just want to share on this side to prepare yourselves for um, people not understanding what you do and equating folks who have been very vocal and very loud in this space um, with uh, behavioral science. Okay, so a token behavioral scientist. Um, I mentioned that I was the N of one. I often fielded really excited emails from people wanting to pick, pick my brain. And at first, you know, that's flattering, right? Because you really are like, oh, wow, like, let me help you. But you were hired to do a very specific thing, and you can't be distracted on a daily or weekly basis. So I set up um, on our internal um, kind of social board, which was through Microsoft Teams, like it's like Slack, uh, a hashtag savory science. And every Friday I would do a science share of a recently published article, write a little synopsis. Um, and I tried to do things like that that I, that I thought would help democratize the value of behavioral science. I would say I want to get people to uh, get bit by the bug that is behavioral science. But you do have to really be careful. Um, there were multiple times that I got caught up in situations where I would send, I would take on a task that someone randomly asked me to do from some far reaches of the company. And then four hours later, I will have produced a one page report for them. And that had nothing to do with my actual job. So, one example is somebody asked me to, how do you measure emotional reaction? They wanted to know if, in a one off, uh, in a user experience environment, somebody would feel happy or sad or attracted to a medical device. And I laugh because it just sounds absurd when I say those words out loud. But I took the task seriously, I'm not um, this type of, of psychologist by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I had some memory of like eye tracking and, and some self support on, on affects, the positive and negative affect scale. And so I went and did that work for her. But that's not what I was hired to do. So I think you have to be really careful with your time um, if you do step into a situation where you are hired as a behavioral scientist and you are an N of one. So I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention it, it cuts the other way as well. So I had no idea what other people did. And I mean that very sincerely. I didn't know anything about product development. I will never forget my manager, who is lovely, an incredible UX researcher and designer. She was like, kept saying this word MVP. And I was like, MVP, MVP. Like, I know what an MVP is, but she can't mean an MVP. So it's the minimally viable product. <clears throat> I 
And if you do find yourself in a product development environment, there are a lot of terms and ways of doing things that you're going to have to get up to speed with quickly. So one thing is marketing requirements. So these are the things that the people on the marketing team are going to say, look, to get competitive in this space, the product or service has to have these affordances. And if you're tasked with building a product, either from an engineering side, a data science side, a design side, an intervention, clinical, what have you, you have to take those requirements and translate them into the product or service. Agile versus waterfall. Waterfall is just building it from soup to nuts and then sending it off to the business to say, look, here's the products that we've developed. And that's kind of the old hot way of doing things. Agile is a much more iterative way of developing something. I didn't know what a product manager was. Um, and that is a really core uh, person and role uh, that sits within product development. So I just have an example here. Um, requirements is the airplane shall provide seating for no more than six people. So it's really getting specific about what it is that the product will do and what the product will not do. Where this can be problematic is if you are in health tech, you don't have to stretch your imagination that far to think through in real practical terms, what that translates to or should translate to is that clinical and scientific expertise is leading the requirements because those are the people that have the training and the background and the knowledge to say that the person, the patient, the user, or if it's from a prevention standpoint, whatever you're building, it's built from a medical perspective. The problem is oftentimes those are not the people that are putting forward the product or the marketing requirement. Okay, so we speak different languages. I touched on this a minute ago. Um, and I think it's worth mentioning a couple of examples. So I often would hear validate that, or I have a hypothesis, or we're going to do an experiment. And I think for validation in particular, um, I have a background in psychometrics, and I kept thinking that people meant like that, like construct validity, like predictive and concurrent, um, and I reliability. You know, oh, do you want to do split half? Like. And they're not talking about that at all. From a diagnostics perspective um, or a medical device, there's often uh, verification and, and the validation is ensuring that um, it is going to do what the product needs to do, you know, from a regulatory perspective or meeting the market requirements. I've never been in a situation where they need it from the psychometric uh, vernacular. Hypothesis is interesting. I've had to let go of that. Um, I often thought it meant hypothesis testing, but it doesn't. Experiments is something I hold on to. And the reason I hold on to that, um, and I want to make sure that people are clear in what they mean, and I will ask questions until we get to a, an answer, is because a lot of times evidence generation is at the core of what people want and need. And if we can't align on what is a true experiment and causal versus correlational evidence, we're never going to advance the effectiveness of the digital health product. And the last common challenge is that scientific thinking and the scientific method are not in charge. So, you know, we're trained to think about um, empiricism um, and that, you know, systematic observation is going to help us understand the world around us. And a lot of times over years and years, There'll be pockets within the company that have attacked the same problem. And the evidence that they've generated from whatever method don't all live in one place. People have come and gone. And the way the decisions get made are not based on empiricism. And I think that's a problem. But I also think it's recognizing that you're not going to change that. And so you deliver the value of what empiricism can bring. Um, while recognizing that a lot of that doesn't exist today. Statistics. <laughs> oh gosh, this is a whole another, we have a whole conversation about this. A lot of folks trained in data science are really, really skilled at coding and they're great at working with, you know, big complicated tables that they have to join, doing SQL queries, what have you, but they're not trained in like tr tried and true statistics. What I mean by that is, you know, they can fit models 
but understanding kind of the way in which data are handled and clinical significance versus statistical significance. And some folks are, but generally speaking, you know, we definitely, I have observed a conflation by folks in the business arena in health tech that statistics and data science are synonymous and they are decidedly not. Lit searches. So I do a lot of lit searches and yet I still feel very disconnected from the literature and it makes me sad. So I do a lot of lit searches because people will ask me what the state of the state is for prevalence, incidence. Um, tell me what the most efficacious intervention is for this. And so I go in and do that. But people aren't trained in how to do that. So you'll run into situations where a senior executive brings to this meeting that everyone's been waiting for for months a single study. It was written 10 years ago, and the person, you know, got written up in, you know, Newsweek or something. And that creates a problem um, because you're not having the same conversation about the state of the state. And the last one is health disparities. So health disparities is at the cornerstone of public health. Um, we obviously, especially in 2020, have heard a ton about the impact of health disparities on COVID incidence, morbidity, mortality. And unfortunately, it often is the case that it doesn't pay um, in health tech to pay attention to health disparities. So from a population, crude U.S. Census population perspective, there are more white Americans than there are black Americans. And diseases are disproportionately going to impact Black, Indigenous, people of color. But from a market share perspective, and especially when you intersect ability to pay, it is an upward battle to get certain companies to pay attention to health disparities. Um, and I will talk about this in a minute with uh, the three things I think you should know. So I think if you ask me this in a month's time, I might have slightly different versions of this. I tried to think long and hard about what maybe I wish I could have heard from somebody or, or things that I thought you might be able to take home with you and, and kind of ponder on. So the first is don't let go of your curiosity, but be prepared for it to perturb people. One of the reasons that I did a postdoc is that I couldn't have imagined my life without being an academic. I love teaching. I had fallen in love with research. I am an extremely curious person. And this can get me in trouble in the industry because I do not stop asking questions. Um, there's a great story that you can ask me more about in the Q&A if you're interested, where a group of very senior people that have been put together on an innovation team had done a cluster analysis using cross-sectional data, self-report health behaviors, and they had developed these clusters and named them turned them into personas, and were developing an entire marketing strategy around them. Well, I was super curious around how those data were handled. And I thought that the senior executives just didn't know that the vendor they hired to do the analysis had really over-leveraged cost analysis. So I went into multiple conversations, very curious, and just like, oh, these people just don't know. Let me help. Let me write up this report. And it really pissed off a lot of people. But I think I learned from from that experience, how to maybe do it better in the future. But I also would not not do it in the future because I think curiosity is what is going to drive innovation in this space. Second is I think that your training and constructive criticism will often be at odds with industry norms. So uh, Dr. Sherry Pagoda and I have actually talked about this a fair bit. And she's the one that gets credit, I think, with this statement. Um, but the point is that you know, we're trained to raise our hand and ask questions similar to the curiosity and to give direct and honest feedback in the moment because we know that that is how things get advanced. And I'm not saying that people in the business arena don't go at each other's throats, but they do it more over business numbers or target markets or forecasting or projections, not necessarily about the things that I am coming to the table questioning or being uh, critical about. And the third is to know your strengths and flex them. So I don't sit before you today knowing all the answers, but I do think I've arrived at a place where compared to three years ago, I can be really clear about what my strengths are. And I think you should spend some time reflecting on what you think those are and bouncing that off your mentors, your friends. You're always welcome to shoot me an email. 
or a DM on Twitter. Um, and what this is going to do is it's going to position you to get a job and to also advocate for yourself once you're in an industry environment. So for me, I have a diverse background. Um, I'm not a specialist in any one content area. I say broadly cardiometabolic health. And so having that diversity enables me to step into multiple different uh, companies building different products. And then my training in statistics and my background in data science does position me well to work with data science. My training and expertise um, in behavioral design and my background in product development helps me to understand how to bring a product to market. And so getting really clear about what those things are and the value add that you have to the company is really important. Closing with the number one question to ask yourself. So what are your needs and boundaries? And can you find, so I lied at two questions. Can you find fulfillment working in industry while respecting these boundaries? So what I mean by that is ethical and moral boundaries. Um, you know, I mentioned health disparities. I think that, you know, I will continue to advocate for and talk about the health disparities. I can't force the company's hand to say that they need to build a product that is for customer segments that aren't able or for whatever reason are, you know, not in a position to pay. But if you find yourself answering this, that your needs and boundaries are not going to be fulfilled or respected in an industry environment, then it might not be for you. I do think that you should give it a go um, because a lot of times we can't really fully answer this question because we're just future tripping and we don't know what it's like until we're actually in the trenches. And closing with the folks that I rely on, um, I'm a huge Glennon Doyle fan, so I just wanted to give a shout out that we can do hard things. And I rely heavily on um, a network of people that I both admire and know. So, you know, Heather, Dr. Heather Cole Lewis um, was a speaker in a past webinar here. I don't know her personally, but I admire her work. Um, I do know Dr. Kate Woolen, Dr. Heather Patrick, and Dr. Amy Buker, and um, they are folks that I try to talk to on a regular basis. Um, they've really been staunch advocates um, and support supportive people in my space. Uh, Dr. Beth Linus, we banter on Twitter, um, and Dr. Marev Cohen, she actually was trained at UCSC, and she's a vendor that I worked with out of an Israeli company um, in the sleep space. Because if we aren't in the trenches working alongside product marketing, engineering, and data science, then they will do it themselves. And I think that we have a lot of value to add. So despite uh, you know, giving a, a very raw picture of what it's like, I hope that you at least do feel encouraged that, that it's worth making the leap. Um, and these are follows that I highly recommend. You might already know all of them on um, Mobile Health News, Stat, Rock Health, and TechCrunch. And definitely get on Twitter. I got both of my jobs um, at OneDrop and at ResMed literally via Twitter. All right, so open it up for Q&A. Awesome, well folks can go ahead and ask their questions in the chat or you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Um, while I wait for those, questions to come into the chat. I know that some were submitted ahead of time. Um, so I'll go ahead. I have one, if that's OK. Oh, please. Hi, Gina. How's it going? Hi, is this Karnisha? Yep, it's Karnisha. Um, so I really like the slide where it was talking about how the culture in a lot of tech industries are like, go fast and break things. And we should step back to do no harm because I did have a job interview and one of the questions, and this is working with individuals to increase inclusion and diversity in a large organization. And one of the questions was, what's the next big thing for this group? And my response, and I hadn't even thought about it before, but my initial response was just, I think we need to step back and do the science focus group, more formative type of research to try to figure out what people want. And I think that goes back to your point about even just text messages. How can we change the way that we communicate with individuals? Because most individuals have a smartphone and 97% of text messages are open. So what do you think a scientist can do or someone from our type of background can do to convince people that we just need to take a 
in uh, an, an bird's eye view of really what's going on, work backwards, go slowly to figure out what people want, and then to implement that to create a product that will benefit a certain group. Yeah, so I think, I think part of it, I guess it's a three pronged answer. So one, I think that as regulation increases, that's going to work in our favor because people are gonna to have to demonstrate that their product is effective, right? Mm -hmm. And right now there's so much smoke and mirrors and that's because no one's really checking the work. And I think a lot of what's out there today is like shiny tech. And so that's what is in the conversation. And it's not really, people aren't really interested in the unsexy text messaging, even though it's effective. Um, and I think as the market gets more competitive, the different business partners. So if you look at like hospitals, you know, they get hit up all the time from startups because the startup wants to do some sort of a pilot or, you know, get a carve out of their patient population. And that hospital often says no, but as it gets more competitive and the hospital turns back to the startup and says, okay, well, show me how your product's effective. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to generate, you know, evidence strategies and, and accumulate evidence. And I think as soon as you start to go down that path, I mean, one thing is when you think about the more complicated interventions, the evidence generation is harder because you're looking at dose response, you're looking at, you know, multifaceted, like in-app engagement um, versus like text messages responded yes or no, like frequency, like the data are just more complicated. I think from a practical standpoint, when you're in the environment, so if you give the example of doing the job interview, um, I imagine that their reaction to that wasn't you know, like really excited because you're asking them to slow down. But I think it's giving lip service or, or paying homage to the fact that they have really tight deadlines. And then mm -hmm. once you're in that environment, you have to be really scrappy. You have to demonstrate the value of why what you're saying works. And so that's also, you know, bringing in the evidence from the literature. But you have to distill it very, very simply. You can't put out complicated reports or slides that, you know, people don't have training. They can't, you know, even reading an abstract. And that's, I can't read complex financial reporting because I have no background in finance. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, so I, I don't know if I fully answered your question on that. The mm -hmm. other thing I'd say is I think that more people like us need to found companies. Because I'm really interested in things that have been tested in an academic environment, similar to pharma, right? Like you look at drug development. That's the approach we really should be taking with digital health. And there's not that many, like, I don't know that much about paratherapeutics, but given what they've had to demonstrate to the FDA and they've gotten approval um, in the mental health space, I think that, that those types of approaches are promising. And that's very systematic year over year, you know, getting yourself, and, and, and maybe it's not a phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trial, but it's, it's some sort of stepwise progression uh, toward really rock solid evidence generation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Who else? Again, anyone who has a question can feel free to throw the chat or unmute themselves. Yeah. Don't be shy, you guys. <laughs> We're all on Zoom together. We're all in a pandemic together. Gina, I have a question. Um, I'm yes. curious about, so you talked about the transition in training from like a postdoc to industry. For those kind of still in that, in graduate school, is there trainings or courses outside that you would recommend to help with that transition? Um, kind of like a continuing education thing, but more applicable to industry? That's a great question. Um, I don't know of any formal education that's specific um, to, to kind of helping you prepare. I think within the societies, you know, I'm, I'm only active now, um, but I am quite active um, in SBM. And I know SBM has a 
um, I don't even know what it's called, but I'm on the panel for the virtual conference next year with Cynthia Castro Sweet. I should have had her picture up as well. So she's at Omada. And, you know, the, it's not in person next year, but it's essentially partnering with you, partnering you with someone who's in industry to have conversations. And I think really building out your social network. And that's not a formal education, um, but I think what that does help with is it introduces you to some of the language. I think if you could, I mean, the internship thing is weird, but a lot of these companies do have internships. And it might feel weird if you already have your PhD to come in at kind of really the bottom rung. But operationally, I think that was the biggest shock. Like, from a product development standpoint, you know, the way that the engineering teams work and how UX and marketing and product and engineering and data science all practically work together would have been really valuable for me to at least have a sense of before I was immediately put in that environment. Um, I know there's like UX courses. So some of my friends and, and uh, peers that I went to graduate school with um, work at companies where they're on UX teams and they're doing kind of quasi like UX behavioral research. And I think that the UX community has a fair number of online um, like courses and things like that. And, and that's, you know, I, I always knew that academics did not build attractive digital health products. But I learn so much from my UX colleagues, and I really think that learning that side of it, depending on which direction you want to go, is super helpful. What is the name of the program within SVM? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can find out and... Oh, yeah. No problem. Um, I was just wondering, because I think I indicated on the registration that uh, I was interested in it, but I haven't heard since, but I just don't want to miss anything because that sounds like an awesome program and I'm excited for it. Yeah, so we j we just filled out, um, like Cynthia, uh, Dr. Cynthia Castro-Sweet just sent around the sign up, and so I signed up. And I think you'll probably hear more, um, so just keep your eye out, but feel free to message me directly if, if you don't. And I think the other thing to think about from the society perspective, so SCM, the uh, new leader, uh, gosh, I'm blanking on her first name. It's, I think it's Monica, Dr. Monica Baskin. She is very dedicated, um, as past presidents have been, to bridging, you know, and Dr. Sherry Pagoda is an excellent example of this, you know, bridging the two worlds. Um, I will tell you that nobody in industry had any idea what SCM was. Um, and everybody, did know what the J.P. Morgan, um, I don't even remember if that's what it's called, but th there's just such a disconnect between what we do in terms of societies and conferences and meeting and sharing our work and what folks in industry do. And like going back to that B.J. Fogg example, like he has the ear of those people and we need to step into that space and share our work because that's really what is going to advance digital health. Great. Well, anyone else who has questions, again, feel free to, to chat them or ask them. I know we're coming close to the end, but we have time for one more. I guess what we can end it with, I mean, it, it came in a few different variations. And though you've given, you know, many pieces of advice during this talk, Dr. Merchant, what would be maybe if you could pick one thing you wish you knew when you were starting out on your, and I know, you know, you sort of took us through your transition, your time, but what do you think would be like, if you could say one most valuable uh, piece of advice for yourself while you were in your academic training that you think best prepared you for the last three years? I mean, this just pops in my head. Um, it is not going to always make sense. Um, and what I mean by that is, I think as a scientist, we're trained in logical 
thinking. And again, this is not to say that we have all the answers, um, but here's a great example. Like one of my boundaries, I mentioned experiments. I also refuse to say proven and it gets used all the time. Like we've proven this, this has been proven, the proven treatment, the proven this. So I went into it thinking that the need that was there was, they just didn't know, right? Like, you know, chemistry, biochemistry, robotics, like those had started to make inroads in non-academic businesses. But in our case, I thought a lot of what was missing was just a lack of awareness and knowledge. But I think it's really this like disconnect, right? And so really kind of, I guess, cutting across a lot of the pieces of advice I gave, like one of the things that I wish I knew is like not come into it with kind of some of the expectations I had, I think made things harder for me. Um, and some of this is based on my personality. You know, I'm an extremely passionate person. I just, I love science and I, I just, I think this is all very exciting and interesting. And I think that, you know, money talks, um, people are gonna make decisions and go after target markets, not because it's what's in the best interest of public health or patients necessarily, but it's because it's what's gonna make the most money. And I, I was really naive to that. Um, and again, I, I don't know, I think that your respective institutions, you know, reaching out to people, reading books, um, going to talks, uh, doing the follows, I said, getting on Twitter, like really listening to people who work in industry, I think will help prepare you mentally and emotionally for what's out there. Yeah, excellent. Well, Thank you again for joining us. That was, you know, I see a lot of comments. It was very informative. I think people found it very helpful. Um, really appreciate you sharing with us um, in sort of this series of, of webinars that we've done. And um, again, I think your insight was really, really valuable today and sort of showing people the other side, the, the not so flashy and glamorous side of working in tech and making that transition. So um, we really appreciate your time and just everyone can join me in. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. It was a great, great talk. We're very happy to have you. Thank you guys very much.